Hello. It's probably time to start. <laughs> la hola, hola, uno, dos, tres. Good morning, everyone. We're going to wait five more minutes for people to show up. Uh, so it's, it's the last day, it's a bit slower than the other days. So let's wait five minutes in order to start. Yeah. credit or or Tigo Casho. Say Omo. Okay. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, we have a yeah, guest. Let in... me see. So I'm on your mobile money or no more your credit. I'm on your credit card. Wait for me to be around me. Totens. Okay, let's try it again. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Sebastian Belagamba. I'm the uh, regional director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the Internet Society. And I'm happy to uh, moderate this panel. There is a collection of uh, rock stars and community networks and, and with, a, with an approach and edge on, on, on indigenous communities and, and underserved communities. So we're going to have a, an, excellent, an excellent panel. I, <clears throat> let's plan this. Uh, th there's too many panelists here. Let's not do it as a panel in itself. Let's do more a uh, uh, roundtable kind of approach. So um, I'm going to go through the, the list for you to, to know the faces, uh, but um, I will let everyone to introduce himself when, when they start. 
Uh, so we have Loreto Bravo, a uh, telecommunication, telecommunications consultant in Rizomatic in Mexico. Matthew Rontanen uh, is a director of technology, Southern California Tribal Chairmans, uh, Chamans. Um, Bill Murdoch, the IT manager, Clear Sky Communications. Carla Velasco, uh, international area coordinator uh, for uh, Redes Comunica. John Dada, Fatsuan Foundation in Nigeria. Ritu, uh, Ritz Batsaba. Sorry, yeah, uh, the, from, coming from digital, uh, um, digital Empowerment Foundation, and Gonzalo Lopez Barajas from uh, Telefonica of Spain. So it's a very nice crowd that we have here in, on stage. Um, I really appreciate you being there, uh, also as, as the audience. Um, can we start? Uh, introducing yourselves. Ritu, if, if, would, would you like to go first and introduce yourself? Tell us what you do and, and we'll start with some questions afterwards. Hello everyone, good morning. Uh, I come from India and I work with Digital Empowerment Foundation. The, uh, this inf we have a, one of the largest community networks in India having access 178 access points and connected 38 districts of the country. Uh, having said that, the, still it's not enough, but uh, we are trying our best. So. Thank you. Carla? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Carla. I'm from Mexico, and I work with indigenous communities in, uh, in Mexico. In three states, we have this project of intranet indigenous communities, and we also have an international area where we do advocacy for ITU and, uh, and CITEL. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Loreto Bravo. I, I come from uh, southeast of Mexico, the state of Oaxaca, and I am one of the collaborators of the Rizomatica organization that develop um, community cell phone networks in indigenous communities. Thank you. Excellent. Gonzalo, please. Hello, I'm Gonzalo Lopez Barajas. I work for Telefonica, so I am a business representative, and maybe I'm providing a different profile here, a different view. And just to let you know, Telefonica is actually having more than 340 million customers. We are present in Europe and, and most importantly, in Latin America, where we are providing services from, for all countries from Mexico down to Chile. And, and the, the news here is that we are also doing innovative approaches to connect people to, you know, in the rural and their safe areas that I, I will share with you briefly. My name is John Dada. I am with the Fansom Foundation in Nigeria. It is a rural women's organization. Um, we have the dubious reputation of having started the first community network way back in 2005. Um, and as at this date today, we are back to the launching part. I'll give you the details later. Yeah. Hello? Uh, Bill Murdoch, yeah. I'm the IT I'm manager you. with Clear Sky Bill Connections. Uh, not Clear Sky Communications, Clear Sky's Connections. Uh, we have a project to run fiber with the goal of running fiber into all 63 First Nation communities in Manitoba, uh, Canada. And uh, hopefully, we'll be breaking ground in the near future. Matthew Antenen, I'm the director of technology for Southern California Tribal Chairmen's Association, and uh, we built a wireless network using microwave point-to-point -point, uh, technology in 2001, and have rebuilt that network three and a half times over the last 17 years to. Uh, get to a more carrier grade solution for our communities, um, 19 federally recognized tribes in San Diego County, um, California. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, I would like to start uh, this uh, chat, this conversation, um, pointing something that, that for us is, uh, from the Internet Society standpoint, is, is very important. We, uh, this is a technology, the Internet is a technology that has spread uh, as fast as any other technology ever had. Um, nonetheless, we need to, to, to go faster. Uh, we, we need to go faster because <clears throat> the cost of, of not being connected keeps increasing for people. Um, so there was a mention of 
long timers and a mention of innovative approaches to, to this. What would be the, the most innovative approach that you think we need to put, uh, to put in a scene in order to make it happen fast? We need to connect 100% of the population, guys. And how, how, how will, will we do it? Who would like to start? Okay, please, John. Right. I, I did mention that Fansom Foundation started its community network in 2005. And it made remarkable progress because um, it addressed the twin problem of access and power. Power when you live in a remote and uh, difficult terrain is, is a big problem. So we had hybrid power, we had solar power, and then we had um, diesel generator. Occasionally, there will be grid, but our emphasis was on the solar and the, and the diesel generator. And then, um, because you were working on solar, you, you needed to be careful the kind of systems you, you need. So we installed what we call thin clients. Some of you may be aware of thin clients. They're very low-powered computers. So it was possible to run these systems on solar power without much problem. And um, we were the sole rural ISP in our region for about 10 years. And then all hell broke loose. Uh, civil war, Boko Haram, and the rest of it. And of course, you lose so much in terms of human resources, human capacity, uh, material resources, and um, you find yourself back on the launching pad again. But I think the interesting thing about the community network is it's, it seems to have an, an inbuilt resilience. Because in spite of um, the massive destruction that we've gone through, we have begun to rebuild again. And without government intervention, I think that is the critical thing, that when communities are able to appreciate the value of their own network and are able to get started with that external support, it becomes more sustainable and more resilient in the face of um, all sorts of adverse circumstances. And interestingly, as you would know, uh, when you are in a war situation and you're coming out, the su survivors, most of the survivors are women and children. And for us, as, as a women's organization, that was critical because uh, they are our primary target, and um, we have to look at what, what, what best meets their needs. It's no longer an issue of um, uh, ICT or food, no. It is ICT makes it possible to access food, to access health, to access other development uh, parameters. So for us, we, we have gone back to the drawing board. We are restarting the various nodes we had. We are, we are reviving the various communities that were connected to our hub. Uh, throughout the, the war situation, our hub was protected, so we still have the basic equipment. So what we're doing now is um, bringing in users into our hub and then gradually farming this out. Um, so I'm quite, um, I quite understand what, what you mean when you say you are rebuilding the network. That's what we've had to do, rebuilding a network. But the interesting thing is, now that we are rebuilding the network, the technologies have improved. They're cheaper and more accessible. Um, the only bottleneck we, we are having is getting the regulator's approval to access some of these technologies. And already we were also addressing that issue. So um, the community network for me is certainly the way to go, especially for communities that have gone through this traumatic experience of having lost virtually everything and having to start all over again. Matt? So um, I think one of the barriers to entry that we probably all share in common, but at least it's, it's the biggest barrier to entry in the United States is the fact that we can't get access to affordable backhaul to the rest of the world, right? So we have several tribes in the United States that have built a network that supports their community, but it is essentially sharing uh, data servers and connecting their tribal municipal buildings and their schools and their, and their libraries program, but they don't have access to the internet at any capacity. And to be able to function without 
uh, broadband speed in today's environment and be competitive, uh, you need to get access to affordable bandwidth. So we've been on a really big push to re reduce that barrier to entry and get access to wholesale uh, fiber so that we can build these uh, community networks. And, and when I was talking about rebuilding our network, it was specifically to increase the quality of service, um, change with the times in technology to be able to carry, carry the greater speeds and the, the more reliable service. And then um, in, in addition, we are also on solar power in San Diego as our reservations are away from the population. Uh, we happen to have 11 of the 12 largest um, uh, mountaintops or highest mountaintops in San Diego County and there's no access to uh, power. So we use solar as well and um, have, have been upgrading our solar system to be able to support the climate change, the, the increased days in the clouds that our, our mountains have. Thank you. I have Carla Gonzalez. Um, yes, hello. So um, with the points that John said, uh, it is very important to have accessibility. It was talking, uh, we, we were talking about it yesterday in the spectrum panel. To have this uh, flexibility in what is uh, the access to spectrum, uh, mostly we as community networks. And I am not saying that community networks is the solely truth of connectivity, but I'm saying that it is uh, it has a big possibility of of um, reaching this population that's still uh, missing. Uh, I was talking yesterday to uh, a colleague, Carlos Rey Moreno, he's also from a community network, and we were talking about this study from uh, Galperin and Gerard, where they talk about the economic models. So we have the uh, the big markets, then we have the small enterprise, and then we have the the sustainable market, the the one that works for itself. So why won't we have that in the in the technology sector? Why don't we have a um, spectrum for the big companies, and then spectrum for for the small providers, and then spectrum for community networks? So so it it could be a way of looking at it. Um, also affordability is very important um, because we as community networks we know that it can be very expensive to compete with these big enterprises and therefore it is a big challenge for us to to um, to show this good alternative that community networks are So if we really want to have all connected in a very short time, what we need is a sustainable and an industrialized solution in order to, to be able to do it in, in a very short time, of, of, of a short time, a short period of time. And that's basically what we are aiming at, what we are working on in Telefonica. And, and the problem is basically it's twofold. One is that the cost of deploying the network is very high, so that means that it's for companies, it's it's pretty much unprofitable to do so, and also that uh, the 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 users are in very uh, low density areas and, and their income is, is is lower. So basically, that means that if we mix the higher cost of the deployment of the network and the lower expectations of income, that leads to a uh, business uh, proposition that it's it's not sustainable because uh, uh, it's, it's it doesn't it's not uh, profitable. So we have to address these issues. And what we are looking at Telefonica is at, at ways to reduce the cost of deploying the network. So we are working with uh, companies such as Facebook and, and Vodafone in the Telecom Infra project. And we are working on a solution, on a radio access network solution that uh, open, that it's based on general purpose platforms. And, and we are uh, already come with a solution that basically reduces the cost on, on uh, from five to ten times in terms of uh, people covered, and also around three times in megabytes uh, provided to the network. Additionally, we have to find, as, as he was mentioning, uh, a way to, to provide the backhaul, and we are coming with 
uh, innovative uh, solutions. For example, in Peru, we are doing it differently. We are uh, hanging uh, fiber on, on, the, on, on the trees, on, on the jungle trees, instead of having to dig, uh, and which is much more costly. We are also looking at a lower and cheaper radio link solutions for the backhaul, and that's also helping us in order to reduce the cost. And, and also it's very important to, to do a, a intelligent network planning because uh, we don't really know where people are. I mean, uh, what we are doing is we are using high definition satellites images from, uh, we are also using our, our data from connectivity and then the national connectivity maps and we are putting that together and, and using artificial intelligence to do a, 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 an efficient network planning. So that's what we have been doing for the last year in Peru, where basically we have about 8 million people that are not connected. And we have very positive, very positive news. We have in the last year connected uh, 25,000 people in the jungle and in the highlands. We have upgraded um, w over 1,000 communities from 2G to 4G. And, and the positive news is that actually people are using our networks and, and we are having a, a profitable business model, which I think is it's the, 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 the way forward if we want to spread connectivity to all, because that's a sustainable solution. It's very interesting because I'm, I'm hearing that um, we have a grassroots people saying that we need more backup from the big transit providers and big transit providers saying we need more capillarity in, in order to reach to, to, to reach the people. So I, I see a, a, a good opportunity for, for partnership. I mean, in, in, the, in that sense, don't you? Don't you think? I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's a good. Uh, I, I think it's, it's very it's very uh, the, the two approaches. I mean, I'm I'm hearing are, are very close together and very close to to be cooperative. Yes, in, in fact, uh, one of the, the innovative approaches we're looking at is, is uh, reaching agreement with, uh, with local entrepreneurships that would be the ones be providing all the connectivity, that would be providing the, the SIM cards, that would be doing all the commercial, even some, some might even be doing some of the network maintenance. So we're doing a, it with a, a commercial approach because we, that we think that in order to have a sustainable network, it has to be a commercially driven solution, but we are looking into ways in which we can cooperate with local communities and, and local entrepreneurships for them to be part of, of our, our, our solution. And, and it's working pretty well because basically we are giving them all the, the, the solutions. We already have the billing systems, the, the provisioning systems that are already in place that we are using in our company. And it's, it's very uh, fast to, to develop a solution for them. Thank you. I, I think that would be really excellent if you would communicate that to the carriers in the United States <laughs> because uh, some of them don't feel the same. Uh, it, it is a situation where um, the incumbent carriers that, that have massive infrastructures that have built out to the point where now it is very expensive for them to go further to realize that some of the community networks are going to be the solution that solve those neighborhoods that they aren't going to get to because there's not enough return on investment, but a smaller community network can solve that problem. So working hand in hand with the provision of fiber and access to backhaul um, at cost affordable rates uh, will really increase that for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, uh, I will have a Loreto written bill if, if you like to, okay, in that, in that order. Loreto? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I want to, to contribute with the discussion from like in, incorporating other um, approach more uh, from the human's perspective, no? And for example, in the case of, of the uh, cell phone uh, community network, um, one of the, the ways that we we decide to create more sustainability in, uh, in the area where we are working um, in Oaxaca is how we can um, have more human resources, not only from the economical perspective, but like, for example, in the case of uh, the cell phone networks, the community cell phone network uh, in the community, who will maintain these uh, networks? Uh, who will uh, fix when it's not working? Who will be uh, more involved in the technical part or on, on the 
in the administrative part. And so as, as, as part of the strategy, we, we decide to create a, a program, an uh, educational program, where people from the community can uh, have access to share knowledge uh, in, in different um, models, like, uh, for example, from the uh, technical um, perspective, for example, people uh, learn about uh, electronic, uh, radio frequency, um, um, and for other perspective, like uh, people um, have access to understand better the, the law um, in, in telecommunications. So the idea is how we can create more human resource to maintain, to sust make sustainable all these networks. And so it's not only from the economical uh, approach, it's more from the human uh, approach, how we can um, make sustainable these networks. Yeah, that, that's excellent. I mean, I think in, in, it incorporates why we're doing mm -hmm. this. I mean, it's because of the people, not just for deploying technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Rito, please. I think the, um, the committee networks, what I feel that the, we are not using the new technology, we are using the existing technology in an innovative manner, in an innovative approaches and the how we are connecting the committees. I'm glad to hear that the uh, that private sector also wants to join the committee networks and trying to connect the unconnected re region, but where I come from, uh, most of the telecom operators do not want to go the rural side, even they, are, uh, they would prefer to pay the taxes instead of going and connecting the rural side of the country. So I'm glad to hear that if, if this hap is going to happen in India, it's really boosting the uh, country as well. So what we are doing, as, uh, we are trying to do, we are using the very frugal and the innovative approaches to connect the uh, rural masses. Simply the line, uh, point to point technology and the line of sight, as well as using the mobile, the vans. Having said that, on a van we are putting up a tar, as well as uh, bringing the backhaul from the tar and taking the mobile vans to the uh, to connect the rural masses. Actually, so we take our vans and go to the rural masses and c also connect to them. So we have a different kind of a models of a community networks from having said that uh, uh, having a physical tar and also the mobile tar as well. And we try to figure it out what kind of uh, existing building, tall buildings exist, and how we can connect to the uh, the uh, connect the masses. In, uh, I completely agree with the Lor uh, Lorita that what we are is, having said that having a human approach and how we are bringing to the sustainability, how these people are engaging with the networks, not only from the technological aspect, but how they are creating the content, how they are part of the engagement in a sustainable approach in creating a log frame, in creating a user clients, or uh, figuring out how to solve the grievances. That's the innovative approach what we are trying to bring into the R committee networks. Excellent, thank you. <coughs> I have Bill, Carol, and John in that order. So, Bill. Uh, well, to, considering we haven't broken ground yet in Manitoba, um, uh, the, the first start would be to, to define the end goal, to define the direction. Um, to, to get the, the uh, consult with the communities, consult with the political leaders, consult with the, the grassroots people, and to define the end goal. What, what is the solution? Uh, how do we get there? Uh, the, well, in, in Manitoba, Canada, it seems that the government comes with, uh, oh, we have solutions, uh, but the solutions they come with uh, creates problems. Uh, and part of the, the problem uh, for, for Manitoba is the, they, they say they're going to consult with the community, but they, quite frankly, they do not consult with uh, the community and the political leaders because many of the communities already have the solutions in place. Uh, they just need the adequate, accessible, and affordable backhaul to be able to tie back to the internet. <coughs> uh, for Manitoba, Canada, they they uh, rely on what they call a P3 model. Um, what that does is a public-private partnership. Uh, it moves the risk from the government to the the private sector, and part of the problem created is there's no business case to 
to install these networks in many of these communities because the population is so small, it's very expensive to get there. So you have to rely on other, other financial and business models to support the network once it's built. Uh, so working with the anchor tenants such as schools, education, other businesses, band offices uh, to help uh, financially support uh, the network once it's built. Uh, but the advantage is once it's built, if you build it properly and sustainable model, if, if it's not a disposable model, uh, then it could be maintained and uh, you could have an evergreen strategy to, to replace it at, at that point in time. Uh, but if you go cheap in the very beginning, and you built it almost disposable, by the time it comes to replace it, uh, it'll be very expensive to replace it. Uh, the example I'm thinking of is um, uh, in the city of Winnipeg, uh, there was a bid to put in fiber to connect to the city. And they did what's called micro-trenching. Uh, so they essentially fixed the fiber uh, 6 to 12 inches into the ground. And at some point in the time, they're going to have to replace that fiber because it doesn't last forever. Uh, it's, they'll, they'll have to dig it up and replace it, as opposed to putting it inside of a conduit. Uh, when it's time to replace it, you just pull out the old fiber, put in the new fiber in the conduit. You don't have to redo the fiber, or redo the conduit. Thank you. Uh, Carla? Uh, yes. Um, it's been a very rich conversation. And adding to what Loreto had said before. Uh, in Mexico we have this special case that I would like to talk about specifically because for example in Mexico uh, the indigenous people are, uh, have this support which is an article in the constitution that accepts their self-determination. Self so this article has been very very useful uh, for our community networks because it defends their right to communicate and inside this right there is a lot of a, a lot of um, access itself a lot of uh, creativity let's say it because in the end the projects that have um, that have been born in Mexico for the indigenous people have been completely created uh, inside their processes which is something that has to be uh, very well known and mentioned. Uh, for example, uh, the, the project of the uh, community mobile telephony, which Loreto is part of, uh, what it is uh, a way of saying we can create this network. So I would say that uh, this creativity that on, not only indigenous people have, but other groups have, can be very useful to, to solve these problems. And in Mexico we have that because thanks to this article, we were able to change the law and now we have social licenses in Mexico, which is very rare in, um, as a case for other countries. No? When, we, when we tell them that we have a social license where a group of people can gather together and do their own community and they can ask for a spectrum band and have it without an, ac an auction and just uh, use it for the benefit of a, of a community, that is uh, certainly one of the most innovative ways of connecting the people. And that's the type of imagination that we should have, not only uh, us as community networks, but also other sectors, the, the multi-stakeholders should have this, um, this mind setting. And I would add it that, I would add that um, also, for example, there are uh, many countries in Latin America uh, that use a universal services fund so this is also a very uh, useful way of having this part of accessibility and affordability. And I don't, I'm not saying that you need to have a social license in your country to, to start a community network. You, you can start a community network and you can find other ways. Uh, for example, there are countries where you can present a project uh, to the Universal Service Fund 
start a pilot and maybe after that you can get the license. So it's also, a, well, I'm, I'm saying that a creativity is a very important thing a, in this process. Just think outside the box that we know. They were also a, talking about it in the spectrum panel. Uh, well, they were saying that the, the structure that we have right now in regulation was based on the nature of the equipment and not the nature of the spectrum. And spectrum is flexible. Spectrum is, is very malleable. So I think we have to change this, this mindset uh, of having just the, the regular ways of, of thinking and open this creativity box so we can think all together of different solutions. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, John. Um, talking about um, optic fiber in terms of uh, back hole ac access, Nigeria has extensive internal opti optic fiber coverage, but for the kind of communities where I work, this is a no-go area. It's just not accessible to them. For example, I have um, an optic fiber that stops just less than two kilometers from my office, but the cost of accessing it is just beyond me. And um, this is why we are looking very closely at the issue of the TV white space. <clears throat> We've been in a year-long dialogue with the regulator. And it's only recently we realized that the, the reluctance from the end of the regulator is not out of malice, was largely out of not knowing enough about the TV white space. And um, fortunately for us, um, a private sector company has been g granted a pilot license to pilot the TV white space. And I came across this private sector o operator, and he's looking for grassroots organizations that can help to justify the social value of this access. So it's, it's as if we, we're coming from two different ends and meeting uh, in the middle, and that is... Uh, working pr uh, pretty well because uh, December 5th and 6th, there's going to be a meeting between the regulator, this private sector, and grassroots organization that are looking for access. So this synergy, hopefully, is something that will come through. Now, the other issue in terms of innovation of uh, how, do, how do rural communities pay for this service is when you're working with a largely agrari agrarian community, you work within the context of what's affordable for them. Um, these communities work in cooperatives, so you already have a, a group through which you can work, an organized uh, group of cooperatives. And it is agreed within this cooperative that communities can pay part of their cost through their harvest. So you have a non-cash payment that meets the communication needs of those communities. And all of this is done also within the context of an ongoing microfinance program. So for me, the viability of any community network has to be very context specific. What is it that works best within that area? What is it that is relevant, that is that's already in, in existence, which you can now build on and uh, maybe modernize and make it more sustainable? Excellent. It's been a very, very interesting things that you said. I mean, thank you, uh, all of you. And, and I wonder, I mean, you, I, I, I may think that you identify uh, needs or barriers or hurdles uh, uh, in three main categories, I mean, I would say. Regulatory ones, economic business model, kind of, a second, and uh, technical. Uh, I, I would say these are the three big categories that I can put all the needs that you, you express. Is there any way to prioritize this? Is one that leads the others, or we have to address all together at the same time? How, how, do, you, how do you see uh, that? I mean, is one that uh, will untangle the others, or, or we have to work all, all, all across the board at the same time? Uh, what would be, uh, and also, what would be the role of governments in, in, in untangling that, I mean, in, in fulfilling the needs? That would be my, my question for you. After this question, we were going to go with uh, some, some answers for this question, and I will open the floor to, to your questions. So if you want to 
start thinking, that would be awesome. So priorities, three priorities. One comes first, and what would the government do? Who would like to start? Matt, I have a, a volunteer. Thank you. So um, I, I hate to say it, but you have to do a lot of it at the same time. Um, in, uh, specifically for, for where I work, um, we have uh, a battle with the access to fiber, which is really a key component, as I said earlier, um, to allowing communities to build their own networks and get access um, at affordable rates. We also have a problem with spectrum that was said, um, you know, talks about uh, in Mexico. Uh, in the U.S., we have the same issue with spectrum. I was at the spectrum panel two days ago, and it was mentioned that there's specs, there is no scarcity in spectrum, which I cringed when I heard that. There's a scarcity in the availability of unlicensed spectrum for access for community networks to be able to use. Um, sure, there's a lot of spectrum in the world, but in the U.S., the military controls 95 or 97 percent of it, and the rest of us uh, get some of the scraps. And it would be very advantageous to open up uh, spectrum in the United States. I believe there's some proceedings coming up at the Federal Communications Commission that does that. So we're working on that front as well as the fiber front. And then, um, you know, a, an education process with the human capacity and the human capital, which was also mentioned, um, is really key too, because there's a handful of us uh, from the indigenous communities in the United States that are doing this work, and literally a handful of us. And out of 573 tribal communities, we need to share that responsibility and grow our successors to be able to um, to expand upon this moving forward and carry these networks to be sustainable on the human capacity front. Thanks. Gonzalo? I agree that you have to work on the three fronts at the same time in order to, to really build a case here because, I mean, that's, that's uh, how we have been approaching it. And in terms of uh, regulat regulation of what the governments can do, I think, of course, Spectrum, it's, it's, it's really interesting uh, that they should be looking at. Um, there's scarcity of a Spectrum, uh, either because it's already occupied, but the, the issue is that uh, there is not so much available. And, and it's also very relevant, the cost of a Spectrum, because um, sometimes we, we say, I mean, you, you have a, a lot of Spectrum and the journal providing service. Well, the, the issue is that we are paying a lot for the spectrum. And if we could be paying less, maybe we would have more resources to develop a networks and to provide services in, in those uh, far off areas and uh, improve much more our business case. And, and we would be able, in exchange of spending so much in the spectrum, spending more in developing the networks. Also, really about, uh, another issue that the governments could look at, it's, it's the quality of service requirements. Uh, it is our aim to provide the same quality experience for our customers um, and that they have the same, uh, the, same th the same bandwidth, the same throughput, that the same uh, rates of, of, of calls that are, are not successful. But for example, if, if we develop a network in the jungle and, and we have uh, the same requirements in time to repair the network, that would actually um, oblige us to have people on all on sites on the on the jungle and I mean that would be impossible I mean so we would need some a different approach into for example the time to repair the time to repair these networks and uh, so th this is one of the issues that that, that uh, governments should look at also if, if we are looking into getting into agreements with other companies in order to provide wholesale networks in these areas because they might be doing a, a, I mean a better job if they, they, we have a specific group that is devoted to developing this network just in these far off areas with a more flexible approach, a leaner model, uh, a more uh, a faster and, uh, and uh, with a different risk profile, lower profitability but still profitability. So we need for them to have some kind of, of, of uh, for example, risk sharing. I mean, we as the grantors of the license, we have all the obligations and, uh, and all the risk is on us if we are to allow these uh, wholesale providers to, to be developing the networks, we would be able to, to share some doubt of the risk and the, the regulators to be aware of that. Excellent. I, I have 
Uh, Ritu, Carla, and Bill. I think the, the, I have a two questions that one is that the one point when you have mentioned that what government can do, the, for example, when I, where I come from, India, the national optic fiber line, which is lying at the village council level, is lying just like that. It's not open for our community networks. So the backhaul connectivity is still there, but we can't use it. Second thing, the TV white spec, the access to a spectrum is not being used by, for our community networks. And the, the TV white space should be open for, uh, uh, specifically like a country like uh, India, it should be opened actually. Um, there is a requirement to, to de-license more spectrum. The cost of a spectrum is really high. And the process of making the uh, lower level and the level of uh, ISP providers uh, is, is a bureaucratic system at systems and it has to be the process needs to be uh, loosened down so that the uh, people can join and the more people uh, uh, people can ask for the spectrum as easily possible. And on the second part of the side, what is the more priority? I, the, I believe that the community needs is a more priority. What do they need uh, is the priority, is the, what, the function of the need uh, is the priority. Instead of having a what technology they are going to use, they are going to use a GSM or a mobile or, a, or uh, having a Wi-Fi hotspot, what exactly they do need it. It depends completely on the community need actually. Thank you. Um, it is a very good question to put order like regulatory, economical, economic or technical because uh, it depends. I'm going to talk about some examples. Uh, we work uh, in advocacy for, uh, sp for regulation, no? spectrum regulation. So, for example, in Mexico, we have uh, the, reg the regulation part complete, we have the technical part complete, but we're lacking the economical part. We're, we're lacking that. And for example, in Argentina, they, might, they do have the technical part, they have the economic part, sort of, uh, still not as, as good as it would be, but, but it's there. But they lack the, regu the regulation part. As well in Colombia, we, we, there are these projects, uh, Altermundi, Colnodo, and I was talking to, these, uh, uh, to a group of uh, civil society from Ghana, and they were telling me that uh, in the technical part, for them, it would be very difficult to start a community network, not because of the regulation and not because of the... Um, well, not because of the regulation, but because their infrastructure and even to, to own a, a device, a mobile device, it's a luxury. So it really depends on the, on the country you are. Uh, you would have to look at it at every pr possible perspective, <laughs> which is very, very difficult to see. Uh, but the three, or the, the three of them are, are very important. And what's most important about this is it is to share the experiences because for example we show the we did show the experience of Mexico to the regulators in Argentina and in Colombia and in Argentina they created the community networks license uh, two months ago so that was a step forward in Colombia is still pending but we are sharing these experiences in order to replicate uh, the, the experiences that, that we have in Mexico. So I would say that all of them are important. It depends. And we have to do this type of forum so everyone can see what the experiences are in every country. Bill, please. <coughs> Uh, in Manitoba, Canada, there's uh, 63 First Nation communities. Um, each First Nation community has an elect elected political leader. So I, I think for, well, for us, I think the priority would be to have the, the political support, uh, to have the buy-in uh, from, from the, the community as well as the, the political leaders of the community, uh, and to respect the First Nation process, uh, the political process in, in Manitoba, Canada. Uh, to to uh, message, uh, to advise uh, the communities of what the benefits of having the fiber in the community, uh, what, what benefits that brings to the community. Because we have many communities that do not have all-season road access. 
Uh, there's currently four communities not connected to the hydro grid. Uh, there's many communities uh, that have boil water advisories, and they've had that for, for many years. Uh, they, so, they, so we're competing with, you know, drinking water, road access, and uh, other services. So why bring this luxury of fiber to the community? Well, to, for the benefit of education and health and, um, you know, to, to communicate and be part of, uh, of, of the world, of the world economy. Uh, once you have the political buy-in, then, then you have to do the technical piece uh, and the finance piece. Because uh, one of the questions that's going to come back is, well, how much is it going to cost? Well, we know it's very expensive, but what's the, what's the dollar amount? What's the ask? Uh, so then you have to start diving into the technical piece to find out the routes to get the fiber there and how much it's going to cost. And then once it's built, how do you sustain it? Uh, then that ties into you know, the education and training and how are you going to use it? How are you going to be safe in, in the environment? Um, then once you have those pieces in place, if you go back to the political model, uh, if you get everybody moving in the same direction with one plan, uh, then having all those voices saying the same thing and not have the competing interests uh, has much more uh, power to the message, uh, especially when you're talking with the, with the government. Uh, so the role of the government would be to respect the First Nation political process because they, they're coming with the solution as opposed to the government saying, here's a solution, but their solutions are typically based on the urban model. And the urban model simply doesn't work in, in rural and remote areas because uh, there's no business case to have multiple internet service providers in a community that might have a population of 500. It, it just simply doesn't make sense. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with uh, different opinions here about which is uh, more important, regulator, technical aspects, or economical model. I think all of them are important. The, 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 the priority is in, need to be related to the context, and each country is different. Uh, and I agree with, with uh, Carla about the, the Mexico. Uh, case uh, in comparison with other countries. Um, in my opinion, it's more anthropology opinion, uh, we need to understand uh, that for the economical model, we need to take in account the social and cultural aspects. What is the role of the cultural aspect of the, of the, of the social environmental in the local context, in the economical uh, model, no? And so, like, we, we are always talking about, you know, the cost of the equipment, how much costs the concession, the license, and all these things as part of the economical model, but we never talk about what is the role of the traditions of the relationship between uh, people in the population uh, in terms of the economical, uh, the local economical model. So we, to me, it's, it's, it's very important to incorporate this like anthropology perspective to understand, uh, for example, when we talk about access and when we talk about, uh, for example, half of the population are women in, in, in the world and in the community too. And this population, this half uh, part of the population uh, that are women, for, for us, these aspects, like how we, you know, like how we live our life in the communities, what is important for us in terms of the social relationships, is part of the economy. Uh, and we don't take in account these kind of things. And so, it's, it, to me, it's not a barrier, it's not an obstacle, it's a challenge that we need to develop more in the community networks. Understand the, the social, the psychosocial uh, aspect inside of the economical model. Uh, I would say uh, about that, that um, we sometimes we confuse the means and the ends. I mean, the end is the people, and the means is the spectrum and community networks and <laughs> and at the end, it's, it must be the end, must be the people. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you very much. All. Uh, any any other op opinion? Okay, I, I will open the floor now. Uh, I don't know if you guys have uh, questions for for the panel. 
please, Eric. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, one question is, uh, our uh, colleague from Nigeria, uh, he said that there, there's a lot of fiber, but they cannot access the fiber. I, I don't know if he could talk a bit more about that, if it's for the prices, if, if, if because there's no how, way to connect to that fiber or, or maybe both, I, I don't know. And the other aspect that I would like to comment on is uh, and the observation that uh, for the operators, if the operators get pay less for the spectrum, um, not necessarily will go and build in places where it's not uh, profitable for them. And that's a, that's a very big illusion. And I think that it's important not to mix these things of coverage and uh, the need that uh, my highway operators to lower the prices of a spectrum because it's a, different, it's a different thing. It's not necessary and it's why demonstrated that when the spectrum um, prices are lower, the operators not necessarily go and invest, but then they get more income and that's good for them, but not necessarily will um, contribute to expand the network. Thank you. Uh, I think the, the first part of the question was about the Nigeria and the second one was about the yes. operator. Uh, concerning the availability of um, fiber network within Nigeria, it's, um, you find this fiber are excellent to all the capital cities. Um, when your community has the fortune of a fiber passing through, and you are a rural community, it just doesn't give you automatic access to it. Um, like I said, my office is less than two kilometers away from one of the fiber stops. And the provider just isn't interested in my kind of uh, community. He's making enough money from the capital cities. Why bother? And there is no obligation from the regulator that he should look at uh, my kind of community. So there is that uh, aspect that in fairness to the provider, he needs to m make money and he's there to make money. He's making enough money as it were from the cities. Uh, but the social context in terms of the bottom of the pyramid where I live is, is, is a responsibility for the government. But what my people are beginning to realize is you don't wait for the government when it comes to this. You go and meet your own needs. And then when the government uh, realizes what you're doing and wakes up to you, they can, they can incorporate you into what they're doing. But uh, the interesting part for me now is that a private sector that has been given a temporary license for TV white space is looking to justify its data in terms of the social relevance of TV white space. So it's beginning to talk to communities like mine so there is going to be, for the first time, a meeting of the regulator, the private sector, and rural communities because of this TV white space possibility. So th that is where we are. Um, eventually, maybe the, the optic fiber will, will, re will, <laughs> will become accessible to us, but a lot of it is redundant, actually. It's redundant, but the companies are making enough money, so why bother? Well, I'm sorry, but I fully disagree on, on the spectrum uh, cost not being part of the equation. It's a very relevant cost for the operators. The issue of extending connectivity into remote areas is a profitability issue, and if we lower the cost, we will increase the profitability. And in fact, uh, that's what we are trying to do, and, uh, and having a lower cost on the spectrum would allow us to, to invest more at the, that we are already doing. In, in fact, in Peru, it is our aim to expand this program to the whole of the country and, and to provide full connectivity in a, recent, in a very short time frame. And uh, uh, we have already some members of this panel already mentioned in that spectrum, having access to a spectrum at a, uh, at a significant low cost, it's, it's good for them. So it is good for us and it's a very big and important part of the equation. Yep. Uh, for Manitoba, Canada, we've, uh, our, our project is to run fiber to the community and then we leave it with the community to decide how to distribute that. So the, and our project is fiber, uh, not, not wireless. Um, so we, at, just 
there, there's actually one community where you have a non-First Nation community on one side of the road, and you have a First Nation community on the other side of the road. And literally at that road, there's fiber. It's just, it's private fiber uh, that's owned by the major telco, and they refuse to run it across the road to, to connect the First Nation community. Uh, one of the businesses in the First Nation community did inquire on how much it would cost to connect to the fiber. Uh, they were quoted $300,000. So a mom and pop shop obviously cannot afford $300,000 to connect to a fiber that's literally across the road from the community. That's the same cost we get from AT&T when we ask that question. And it's typically because they say it's a long haul fiber route that they have to break to access it. When we see an AT&T cell tower a quarter mile away, we know it's broken. So it's their barrier to entry that they've imposed upon the community. Um, and fun enough, I had a competing fiber company work with me in Southern California and at CenturyLink, and CenturyLink opened up their fiber for access uh, at no cost on that level to, um, to be able to connect to. And then at the time I lit the CenturyLink fiber for our community, AT&T opened up their fiber at no cost to the community, but it was going to cost me a quarter million dollars to, to do it initially. Um, and then initially I had a question, the reason I raised my hand was, um, John, is there any opportunity to um, get access to the fiber where it ends and use wireless to shoot yourself uh, a, a very fat pipe, you know, wireless pipe to get backhaul to where the fiber ends? Because two kilometers is so short, um, there's so much technology. I just don't know what frequencies are available in Nigeria to be able to to use that, um, you know, that, that type of a solution. But where I'm at, if I had a two kilometer hop from fiber, I would be pushing a, a two gigabyte or two gigabit per second um, pipe with wireless to be able to do that. And, and then I would solve my problem without actually working with a fiber company to get over to me. Let's give John the opportunity to, to answer the question that Matt. Um, we have had discussions with the um, provider, <coughs> and the, the thing is, we're such small fries for them. They, they, in terms of this, this social returns for them, it's, it's, it's just insignificant. Uh, it, it is frustrating, um, but that's the reality of the situation. That's one. But again, um, Maybe in fairness to them, we, we are just coming out of a war situation, and um, they think we are high risk in terms of any other issues. So we, we bid our time, and um, hopefully in, in time uh, when things are more settled. Yeah. Carla, and we go for questions. Uh, yes, no, I just wanted to add uh, to the comments of my colleagues that in Mexico we also don't know, like we don't have access and there's no transparency of who owns the fiber uh, close to yes. the communities we work with. So that's also an issue. Okay, thank you. I have a question there, here, and there. Yes, hello, uh, my name is Vasilis and uh, I am from uh, sarantaporo.gr community network from Chris. Uh, concerning the um, prioritization question that you posed earlier to the panel, uh, b uh, to choose or to prioritize between technical regulation and financial. What was missing from the question, I think, is the community building aspect. Because when we are talking about community networks, the, mo the most important thing, for, in my opinion, and the, differenti the differentiating factor between the community network and whatever other network is the community. And it needs to be built um, in a very um, yeah, intense way, and uh, it's a job per se. So uh, um, this is one uh, point. And the second point is that, uh, in my opinion, we cannot prioritize. Community networks are very f are live organisms. They are uh, very flexible, they are fluctuating, they are water, they are flo flowing. So uh, all the uh, technical regulation, financial aspects are interweaving and uh, they, uh, you cannot just start from one point 
And, and to one other point, I mean, you have to work with all this together. And we work with all this together in the context of building a community. Thank you. Very good point about the community. Yeah. I, I completely agree. Uh, any, any reaction to this? No? <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. My name is Rajendra Gupta. I'm from India. And uh, I'm a policy maker. So four years ago, when I was writing the manifesto of the current party, my wife was trying to reach me. And when she couldn't reach me, I wrote a line in the document saying, there is tremendous need and scope to improve the quality of voice and data. Now, four years of the government have passed. We haven't seen, and I'm so happy that on this panel, you have taken up this contentious issues, which is very important for delivery of any services we are talking about, whether it's community or it's in towns. So I want to ask, I think there was two opposing viewpoints that if you lower the cost of spectrum, the quality does not improve, which is said telecom operator wants to make money. Now, I want to understand one thing. In my country, the depth of the industry is twice the turnover. There is no way ever they can make money or render quality services. So the point I'm asking is, are there any examples of models from telecom operators across the world where there's a revenue sharing and there is a good quality of services and also lower um, what you call the pricing because unless that is there no government is going to come on to revenue sharing I mean I had discussions multiple times so are there models available which we can look at because I think this is critical if you're talking of quality of services thank you thank you Gonzalo? <laughs> Well, uh, as I, I try to, to convey, that's basically what we are doing. We are uh, experiencing with a new innovative approach in Peru, and our aim would be to extend the, the, the coverage to the whole of the population in, the, in a very short time period. And, and uh, we are doing it with the same quality. We are using uh, 4G. I mentioned that we upgraded 1,000 communities, and we got 250,000 additional users in these communities that had been migrated from 2G to 4G, and we are providing the same quality experience that we are looking to provide in, in, in the urban areas. So I think this, this is a, a, a proof point that, that it's still at a very early stage, but that we, it is our intention to, to, to expand uh, to, to other areas, and, and, and as, as we prove, as we get more experience, and we prove it's, it's, it's a, 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 a good business case and, and we will be developing, we are looking to develop it into other countries uh, uh, when, when we have all the data and, and we have more experience in order to, to have a faster development. I, I think uh, there's there's two pieces to that and, and there's there's two different aspects. So it's from Telefonica or any any incumbent telephone company that is chasing Spectrum it's an auction process that is very expensive for them. For community networks, there's no option. We don't have access to that spectrum, period. So we're constantly looking for opportunities to have access to unlicensed spectrum because we cannot afford to be in that auction. We don't have that kind of capital or support. And in the United States, there are a couple of situations where tribes actually own a piece of spectrum, and it's because they bought an existing telephone company that bid for that spectrum previously. Spectrum license stays with the company and was purchased by a tribe. Tribe is lucky enough to have access to that spectrum now uh, to be able to run their own uh, tribal phone company. But yeah, that is, uh, it's, it's a twofold problem. It's, it's expensive for for the big carriers to be able to get that spectrum and then they transfer that cost to us uh, to be able to absorb that cost and so the end user gets penalized if you will for the price of that spectrum and then the community side of things we don't even have access so thank you thank you Andres? hello i am Andres Astre from Asiet. you have mentioned about uh, affordability of handsets as a barrier how are you approaching this problem Uh, if, uh, you, you were mentioning affordability of the handsets as a, as a barrier. Uh, how you face that, that barrier? Uh, I don't know who, who, who was the, the one. Many of them have that. mentioned so. Yeah, the CPE, uh, I mean, how the, the CPE, uh, I, you mentioned the CPE issue, I, I remember. So I don't know who, wanna, who wants to take. 
How, how, you, how you handle the, CP, the CPA barrier? Uh, so frankly speaking, we do face a lot of a problem in terms of uh, uh, affordability of the devices and affordability and the cost of, of the devices. Uh, okay, the cost of devices are still higher, specifically in India, that the devices is, uh, the, the minimum cost is $50 or something like that, which is a, which is a huge cost for us. However, uh, uh, thankful, uh, it's, uh, the de um, but we do not use so much of our devices or equipments as per the as the de devices as per one device. But yes, the mobile handset, which is required for the committee to use it, um, that cost also we uh, sometimes we are bearing it because we provide the spe specific space to access those devices and the center to access those devices. Uh, that cost sometimes is uh, is on a model that people do come access the device and then they pay. They pay for that particular service. They do not pay for the device, actually. They pay for the particular service, for example, the printing cost or the, uh, the cost of a photocopy or the cost of a uh, scanning or the cost of a certain uh, documents to access it. Or if they are accessing the data, they pay a minimal charges for that. If they do have their own devices, they pay the internet cost for accessing that duration or the period. Uh, it can be the one hour or two hour or a one day or a week as well depending upon how much the person can pay for that particular service. It completely depends on that. It may, may be the one cent to five rupee, uh, maybe f uh, one cent to the one euro as well. But it completely depends actually. Uh, the second cost is the device of configuration for the wireless technology or the equipment cost. That also we are into that, into terms that we are into the very minimal and the frugal innovation. We do not use so high cost devices as well. Sometimes we mostly use the existing uh, buildings. Some, we also use bamboo and the tallest bam, uh, trees as well to put, place our routers. The cost of router is in our in country is a 3,500 rupees, which is a, about $50, uh, $80 or something. So still we are maintaining with the uh, kind of a, in a technology we are using is a low maintaining the uh, devices cost actually. Uh, just to touch on that. So um, the effort that we're making in the United States with the uh, Native American communities is to not have this be your broadband experience. We're trying to move away from the cell phone to being the broadband experience. If you don't have any connectivity, this is a brilliant thing. However, if you're a child doing homework, good luck on a cell phone. It's very impossible. I mean, you can do research, uh, you know, Wikipedia, things like this, but you can barely write a paper on a cell phone. You can barely compose a report or uh, build a document, um, apply for a job, things like that. And so we're, we're looking to reduce the barrier to entry as, as each home gets connected to bring the customer premise equipment, the CPE, down in price. And so when we look at a, a newer spectrum that's available to us now, the TV white space, we're still eager for more products to be on the market, more vendors to be on the market to drive that price down because right now it's about $1,000 per home plus the access point is, is quite expensive. And um, with the manufactured products that are on the market currently, I know that there's some innovative things going on with some of the, the builds that are happening and some of the chips that are being put into some of the community-based things. But you know, the access that we have at the moment is, is quite expensive. So we're looking at gear that costs $89 per home. And you know, that can still be expensive in some, some countries, but um, we're trying to get away from the mobile device being the only access to broadband. So it is very important to drive that price down and look for opportunity and promote those folks that are building products that, that help us do that. Gonzalo Bio, and then we go for a question. Yes, uh, I think that, that you raise a, a very important issue is that we are using handsets that are not standard, that they are not uh, mass market produced, then the, the prices are very high. And that's m the main reason why we are using standard, standard uh, uh, mobile technology to, to, to provide connectivity in, in Peru, for example. So we are using standard mobile handsets, which basically are being massively produced and the prices are going down significantly. So if we were, for example, to use uh, white spaces or another spectrum, which is not the standard one, then uh, we would need to have specific handsets being made for, for, that, uh, for that approach, for that uh, solution. And that would really bring uh, prices up. So 
with the current trend of, of pricings of, of mobile handsets and smartphones, uh, I think that, that that's a, a great uh, a great solution to have standard uh, uh, technology, so that uh, they will get the same experience, and that that. That does not only help uh, affordability, it also helps usability. So that means, for example, that people living in these rural areas, when they go to the urban areas, they will be able to use the same handset because they, they, they will be in the same kind of networks and the same frequencies that the rest of the people. And that will also mean that people going from urban areas to, to those uh, far off countries will still be able to use their, their regular phones and, and be able to use it. So that's also impacts uh, the usage of, of, the, of, the, of the network. And that also has a, a great impact because uh, it, it's easier to, to do the, the technology upgrades. And, and it's based on the standards and, and, and that uh, uh, impacts the sustainability because uh, the, the networks can be upgraded more easily. Uh, well, for the First Nations in Manitoba, Canada, uh, many of the First Nations do not have cell service, so there's really no, no point of having a cell phone. Uh, some of the communities that do have cell service, the, the backhaul is either uh, uh, wireless terrestrial or copper-based, uh, very limited bandwidth. So the bandwidth that is available to the community quickly becomes saturated and communications become very, very limited. Um, in one community, the, um, when the hydro... Uh, person comes in to, to do the meter readings, uh, etc. Uh, they'll actually switch on the cell phone service for the community, so that the technician can can use the cell phone. And then when that, when that happens, the community knows about it, and everybody sort of huddles around the uh, communication tower to to access you know cell phone, the internet uh, that way. But then when the technician leaves, they switch it off, just because of the cost and the bandwidth limitations. Thank you. I have two questions from from the audience, and some time to to wrap it up. And so. We have the two last questions there and, and, and here. Can, can you make it both and, and, and we, we reply to all? Please. Thank you. Hello. My name is Leonid and uh, I am general manager of APTLD, which is an association, the association for country code top level domains across Asia Pacific. So in this capacity, I usually, uh, well, frequent all those IGFs across the region. So my question is very simple. With all these examples, and uh, it's, it is not for the first time that uh, there is such a session uh, at the global IGF. Is there any chance that uh, somehow the community here or just outside of this room can get organized in terms of, uh, you know, creating some repository of BCP's best current, uh, current practices so that uh, we could have a kind of manual for those who are dying for uh, this kind of expertise but don't know where to find it. I mean, using very simple templates, one or two pagers, you can actually create a difference or we can create a difference. Uh, whether under uh, ISOC or even, God forbid, ITU, can I say that in this audience? Anyway, so, I mean, that would be uh, some kind of practical outcome without making any decision as uh, uh, enshrined in the IJF's mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, good morning. I'm Sean from South Africa, uh, part of uh, Zenzeleni, which is a community network initiative. Uh, just a quick comment before I ask the question. Uh, on the mobile devices, I agree. Uh, the research we've done in South Africa in, in poor areas, public access, they prefer public access spots because they can't do many of the tasks they want to on mobile phones. Um, my question really is coming back to the innovations on access to spectrum. Um, so we're putting forward an argument to government in South Africa at the moment uh, because we found, because our community network initiative is targeting rural areas, that there is licensed spectrum there that's not being used. So we're putting forward an argument which we're calling it use it or share it. And I'm just wondering if there's anyone who's successfully being able to argue something uh, like that in, 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 in other countries. But uh, we think we're making a compelling argument. Um, We've just made those inputs, now we're still going to wait to see what happens. Thank you. I, I, it was good for, to, to put all two questions together because they relate to, to, to each other. And the first, I mean, the second one is about information that we are not sharing, <laughs> like, like the gentleman on, on the back said. I have read two 
Okay, Ritu, Matt, Loreto. Bien. Uh, with respect to the first of the questions reply, there are the DC committee on a committee networks is uh, made in an IGF and there is uh, three from the last three years from the since 2015 we are publishing the book and it has a compilation of all the committee networks and the models sustainability models and this year we had published how we can make the community network models as well. However, as a part of a ISOC, there are recently the ISOC and the Asia Pacific, where I come from, we had organized community network exchange for South Asia Pacific region, and where more than 10 community networks from the South Asian Pacific region had participated. Yes, there are some uh, the bit and pieces are com compli compiling. The only um, the one is the. Uh, the compilation is already available in a D, uh, IJ website, the DC community website. ISOC has a great resources of, on a community networks. Association for Progressive Communi Communications have a great resources on a community networks. And similarly, other, we all have a same kind of a resources, which we do share all of them. There's a complete mailing list on a community networks as well. Uh, Sec on the second part of the, uh, the question where, where I had you, uh, meant from the use and share it, uh, we are also doing a, some bit of those kind of a resources in India, trying to, because uh, we do not have a uh, so policy that we can share the bandwidth. However, we are also trying to use that if we can, if we are not using the bandwidth for a time long, if we can use, share with some other people. So right now we are also trying to do something like that. Thank you. Um, just one minor comment on that, because ISOC was a couple of times um, mentioned, and I'm the responsible person, the leader of the community networks effort in ISOC. And uh, thank you very much. We also need the centralized thing. I mean, uh, we, we, APC has a lot of information. ISOC has a lot of information. The DC3, in, in, uh, we are not coordinating well. I, I, I tend to agree with the, with the gentleman there. Uh, Matt, please. So I'll go in reverse order. So the, the spectrum question, it, I don't, I don't know if I'm addressing it specifically, but one of the things that happens in the U.S. is, is a spectrum license is allocated for an area that's very large, and a, the incumbent will serve 70 percent of that area and not in, ever intend to serve the final 30 percent of that area. We've gone to the Federal Communications Commission several, several times, and we've put into the document or the, or the docket, if you will, comments that say, um, well, for lack of a better term, use it or lose it, but they don't accept that. What we'd like to do is a, what's called a secondary market license where we can carve out a section of their domain, if you will, and be able to deploy that using that spectrum ourselves. Still is an impasse um, with the incumbent. They tend to hoard that spectrum. So I, I don't know if that addresses some of what you're talking about, but that is what we're working on. And then um, as far as documentation's concerned, a gentleman in the back, um, and I, I don't know if I'm speaking for everybody, but for myself, we are working so hard to get people connected that we're really bad at documenting what we do. I mean, we're horrible. We have, we have had uh, President Obama's videographer attend a week of, t of working in the field with us, Hope Hall, she's brilliant. I have you know, an entire week's worth of video footage of our network and, and what we do. We have not done anything with it because we're so busy just trying to connect that next house. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Bill so that we can kind of consolidate what we're trying to put, prove. Uh, being busy, yes, we're an office of uh, six people right now. Uh, so yeah, we're always crazy busy. Uh, under ISOC, we're uh, well, with, with Matt, we're looking at starting a, either a special interest group or a uh, chapter specific for the First Nations. It's very early stage yet. We still have some discussions on that, so that, that'll be hopefully in the next, for the next board meeting of the ISOC. Uh, for Canada, there's the FMCC, which is the First Mile Connectivity Consortium, uh, firstmile.ca. Uh, I work with part of that group, and we have a number of stories published uh, on the website. Uh, as for the spectrum, the for, for cell phone service, 4G and 5G, and, and looking in the future, 6G, uh, you have to have fiber to the tower to be able to support those technologies. So you're looking at a, a last mile solution, but we need the first mile solution. Or if you're the government of Canada, they call it the middle mile. We call it the first mile. So we need, we need the fiber to support the last mile, uh, which is what we're working on. 
I have uh, Loreto and, and Carla in the list, uh, and Gonzalo, and, I, I, and we have five minutes. So yeah. please do your intervention and wrap it up, and the rest, if they want to take a, a couple of seconds. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree that sometimes we, we do a lot and we don't document uh, enough to have more information. And one of the models that Rizomatica um, believe that is the way to uh, replicate this experience is open the, the experience and the, the knowledge that uh, people need to, to have access for uh, create other networks in other parts of the world. So it's, it's like very important create these kind of spaces inside communities, between communities, inside the academic world, inside of a technical community, and because it's important to understand that uh, the, the, the sustainability of this um, uh, movement, <laughs> I, I, I believe it is a movement now, when, when we see that there are community networks in many different places and some of them are not connected between them, and, but they have a lot of things in common. I think this is very important uh, thing that we learn, no? It's like uh, read to come from India and have a, a, a lot of experience and the, the, the the possibility, the privilege to be together and share experience and share like uh, all the obstacles that we face is part of the sustainability of the model uh, of the community network in, in, the, in, this, in this world and understand that this is a movement that is f fighting against the, like, the, the, the situation that we face now that is like a most of the, of the people uh, that don't have uh, access uh, to the internet uh, is because like they are uh, a economical model that marginalizes a lot of people in this world. So yeah, it, I think for me, all the four uh, libertades, uh, how do you yeah. say? Uh, freedoms of the free software movement are the base of how we can share uh, the experience that each community network is building. Thank you. Carla? Uh, yes, uh, to wrap up, uh, I want to um, I wanted to say that yesterday it was the launch of the Gizwatch report. Uh, this has the experience of community networks around the world uh, from uh, this organization called APC. So uh, it, it is a good way to start to look at community networks that exist already. So that is um, one part. The second part, we're launching a paper with ISOC on community networks specifically and on experiences of community networks in Latin America is going to be available this, uh, this month. And this paper talks about the experiences of, the regulatory experiences of the countries, not specifically on community networks, but uh, it shows ways of moving around the regulatory environment in order to see if there are opportunities for community networks. Um, uh, lastly, uh, I would like to say that uh, I completely agree with uh, Loreto. Uh, we have to make a difference between rural uh, areas and urban areas because normally we tend to say that rural areas and are underdeveloped and they're not. They're, they're just different areas. So this means that they don't have, uh, they don't need a traditional way of connecting like uh, urban areas do. They're just different and as different, they have different char characteristics and different ways of being and different ways of, organi of organization. So uh, with this, I would like to say that to think the traditional way of uh, connecting is the one that we all know might be wrong. <laughs> so it is uh, something that we have to rethink, uh, rethink about connectivity, rethink about uh, 
the ways of uh, having the technology around us. And this is why I'm so proud of the community networks movement, because it, it has helped to create a solution that might be uh, useful for what's left of connectivity in the world. Thank you. <laughs> Gonzalo, please. Uh, Gonzalo and, and Matt, do you want to say something? And, and we're on time now. So. So if, if we take all the people that is not connected in Latin America and we add them all together, that would equal to a market size of Colombia. So, I mean, whoever says that we are not willing to connect that, I mean, we're a company and, and, and we would love to have a market of the size of Colombia added to our, our, our customers. So, I mean, our objective as a, a telephonic, uh, as a company is to provide service to as many people as possible. And that's what we are trying to prove in Peru with this new innovative approach. And we, are, uh, we have just connected 25,000 people in, in, in the jungle and in the highlands. We have upgraded, as I said, uh, uh, over 100 communities to 4G. And, and just saying that, that we have the spectrum and we don't use it, and it's probably a little bit simplistic approach. We don't use it because it's not profitable. We are looking to new ways to have a profitable case and, and to be able to, to develop uh, uh, the network into those areas and to provide service to those people. So we need to find uh, uh, the best use of that, uh, of that uh, spectrum. We need to find uh, what is the best solution. I mean, saying that we don't use it, so we should give it for free. No, we have paid for it. And we have maybe the solution is to provide it for a lower price and, 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 and so that we are able to, to develop uh, uh, a network in much, much more uh, uh, spread uh, across the country. So the good news that we are having now is that we are developing networks in, in the jungle, we are connecting people, people are using the network, and we are very uh, uh, excited about this opportunity and, and uh, with the results that they're getting that we are expecting to expand even further. And I just wanted to close with saying that uh, I'm I appreciate that ISOC is focusing on community networks and has, has um, grown that focus internally and hopefully in 2019 we'll have uh, more to do with community networks because every time community networks get on the panel and, and talk to an audience, it opens up doors and opportunities and creates awareness for other folks that are maybe thinking about trying to get into this or how to solve their community's problem. <clears throat> And, um, you know, with the creation of the special interest groups that are, that are existing and the Indigenous Connectivity Summit that's happened and then the Indigenous uh, chapter uh, for North America, we're hopefully are going to have, like the gentleman in the back said, have an opportunity to uh, have a repository for a bunch of information so people don't have to go out and recreate this. Um, you know, we're all accessible, but we're all extremely busy as well, so it'd be nice to have a place where you could at least get a start. So thank you. And I'd like to thank you all uh, for this, and please a uh, big applause to, to them. Thank you very much for you attending the, the session. Gracias.